I'm Dom Nichols, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we bring you the latest military updates from the front lines, discuss the Ukraine recovery conference ongoing in Berlin, and reflect on last week's commemorations for D-Day 80 in Normandy. Bravery takes you through the most unimaginable hardships to finally reward you with victory. If we give President Zelensky the tools, the Ukrainians will finish the job. Slava Ukraini! Nobody's gonna break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday, we sit down with journalists from the Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring in the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Tuesday, the 11th of June, two years and 109 days since the full-scale invasion began. And today, I'm joined by Assistant Comment Editor Francis Dernley. I started with the latest news from Ukraine. Quite a few diplomatic bits and pieces going on, but we'll start with the military as always. And a Russian military jet has crashed during a training flight in North Ossetia. That's killed two people on board, Moscow's Defence Ministry said this morning. So the Sukhoi Su-34 jet crashed in a mountainous area. Uh, Russia's MOD said there was no damage on the ground. I presume they mean other than the, the aircraft. They said a technical problem appeared to have caused the crash. It follows, but obviously unrelated to um, another Russian jet that was, that's was that been shot down in Ukraine. So the one that was uh, in North Ossetia, that's kind of Georgia, north of Georgia uh, region. So nowhere near the, um, not inside Ukraine. But another jet, a Russian Su-25 bomber, was shot down in the Pokrovsk area yesterday. So Donetsk City, the push to the northwest of there through Avdivka, that's a kind of Pokrovsk front, if you like. Ukraine's general staff reporting this morning, the Su-25, which NATO uh, codename Frogfoot, is a, is a ground attack aircraft, mostly using in close air support. That term, close air support, is it means close to the ground and close to the to the front line. It it's supposed to provide the bubble under which ground troops can then go and do their thing. But that necessitates the aircraft being much closer to the immediate front line rather than staying back and lobbing missiles in. And hence, more of these type of aircraft or aircraft performing this role are shot down. There were two Su-25s uh, shot down last month, for example. Now, the Kiev Independent, citing uh, Ukraine's general staff this morning, said that, uh, that this takes the total... Russia of six, they've lost 685 Russian aircraft since February 22. That is made up of, we think, about 360 ish planes, uh, aircraft, you know, jets, uh, of which there are, we think Russia has about 40 or started the, the, um, the war with about 40 uh, Su 25s, but also over 300 helicopters. And it's thought that at least half of those helicopters have been destroyed. So I, I turn to the IISS, the International Institute for Strategic Studies here, and their um, their military balance, the, the annual sort of Bible on all, all things numbers and capability. They say that Russia has, well, as of, as of 2022, had about 360 attack helicopters, 20 electronic warfare, 313 transport helicopters, and about 70 held for training. So of that total... If it's assessed that that 326 helicopters have been shot down, that's about half of Russia's entire fleet of rotary wing. Not a uh, not a great statistic if you're sat in the Kremlin. Next, there's been more details released about Sunday night strike on Crimea. We talked about it yesterday, but it was in in the sort of broadest terms. Ukrainian general staff last night gave an update after we'd recorded. They said their forces had struck a Russian S-400 air defence battery near Zhankoy. It's in the north of Crimea, and then two. S-300 batteries near Chornomoskia, that's on the west coast, also northwest coast of Crimea, and Yav Pretoria, that's on the on the west coast. These are, these are all double-digit, significant double-digit miles north of Sevastopol, but along that, that west and northwest coast, those last two. Now, Ukraine's general staff said they'd also, in these strikes, hit the radar stations for each one of those batteries and caused secondary ammunition detonations. They noted that Russian air defences had not intercepted any of the Ukrainian missiles we spoke yesterday i spoke yesterday about my amazement that russian air defense are not covering these these highly um, valuable assets part of the reason for that may be in an in an assessment uh, today the isw institute for the study of war us based think tank they cite the crimea based atesh ukrainian partisan movement that put out a notice yesterday 
saying that they had observed Russian forces had been redeploying air defence systems from occupied Crimea to Belgorod Oblast. Belgorod is the Russian Oblast north, sort of north and northeastish of Kharkiv, that kind of area there. And uh, Atesh also saying that Russian air defences are now not completely covering Crimea as a result. So one thing follows from another, but the permissions, if you like, to uh, given to Ukraine to use Western weapons inside Russia, you know, even though it's very limited, and uh, here I use one of my hackneyed old phrases, you can't be a little bit pregnant, but for now I note that the permission has been given to use Western weapons just, just around uh, the Kharkiv area. I think that policy position will shift but um, uh, for now, it's just in the Kharkiv area. But you can also you can immediately see that that area, Kharkiv and to the north over the border, Belgorod Oblast, if it's having the effect that Russia is then having to take air defence out of Crimea to defend Russia, it then puts the pressure on Crimea. So this this I think this is all all part of Ukraine's strategy to deny Crimea as a as a militarily significant holding for Russia. Next one, the Biden administration, sort of connected to what we were just saying, is thought to be on the verge of lifting its ban on allowing a okay, controversial Ukrainian military unit to use U.S. weapons. This reporting comes out of the Washington Post last night, citing State Department officials. They are saying, or they are, they are quoting unnamed State Department officials, and saying that they are going to reverse a decade-old prohibition on the Azov Brigade being able to use American training and weapons they say new analysis has found no evidence of human rights violations by the unit. This is the Post reporting this. In a statement department statement obtained by the Post, they said, after thorough review, Ukraine's 12th Special Forces Azov Brigade passed Leahy vetting as carried out by the US State Department. Now, the Leahy vetting, the, the Leahy laws, bar US military assistance to foreign units found to have committed such violations. The Azov Regiment, which has past has roots in the sort of far right ultra nationalist fraternity it's now part of ukraine's national guard uh, evolved out of a battalion that was formed in 2014 fought against the russian backed separatists the little green men who were uh, pushed into into the east unsurprisingly this decision to lift the ban on armed supplies to to the azov unit has been described by kremlin spokesperson dmitry peskov as extremely negative and he said the move shows that Washington will will not stop at anything in its attempts to hurt Russia. All right, fine. He's going to say that. I think it's interesting if, if that's their position, the US is not going to stop at anything. OK, so if the West could be accused of self-deterring, then surely, Mr. Peskov, with a line like that, you are admitting, you're accepting that the West or the US has already crossed one of your red lines. So what are you going to do about it? Anyway. Next one, a couple more for me. Uh, Finnish authorities reported that a Russian military aircraft had temporarily violated Finnish airspace yesterday. The Finnish MOD is looking into the incident. It said that an unspecified Russian military aircraft flew about two and a half kilometres inside Finnish airspace around the Gulf of Finland for a couple of minutes yesterday morning. The Russian MOD didn't respond to that allegation, but did say that Russian Tu-95 MS missile carriers and Tu-22 M3 bombers, the big Tupolevs, they've been conducting flights over new, what they say neutral waters of the Baltic, Barents and Norwegian seas. Um, so, yeah, OK, Russia's saying that, that they've been over neutral waters. I guess they need to brush up on the map reading then. This obviously continues the behaviour of just pushing the edges of accepted international behaviour, violating a bit of airspace, um, we're going to have a really interesting report on Friday, I think, from uh, from Gaz Caulfield about the uh, the recent incidents of of GPS jamming in the region and, and all the stuff that that is that we allege it is alleged that Russia uh, are doing to uh, to violate sort of international norms and safety norms of air airspace and, and operation of of aircraft. But um, that's the news for now, and uh, like I say, more from Gaz on Friday, hopefully. But that's it for me. Uh, Francis, it's been a very big week for diplomacy. There's been the recovery, or there is the recovery conference on now. There's also been the uh, the BRICS conference. But let's start in Germany, please. What have you been looking at? 
Well, thanks, Dom. It's good to be back on after joining that convoy of ambulances driving from Normandy to Ukraine. More on that later and a full episode in due course. I made it as far as Munich, actually, which is appropriate, as you say, given that this week is this year's Ukraine Recovery Conference currently taking place in Germany, with most of the focal points being in Berlin. So let's start there. Longtime listeners will recall that Britain hosted the inaugural one last year. And this year, it is Germany's turn seeking to gather support for Ukraine's recovery from the destruction wrought by Russia's war, as well as perhaps more critically sending a new signal of solidarity with Kyiv as far as its Western allies are concerned. It comes before the G7 summit of Ukraine's leading Western allies in Italy and the Global Peace Summit in Switzerland this coming weekend. So it is, as you say, a really big week diplomatically coming off the back of the D-Day commemorations where many key Western leaders were present, but we'll chat about that later on. This conference, the Recovery Conference, will be attended by at least 10 prime ministers. So very significant, this. Zelensky arrived in Berlin last night. He said that he and Chancellor Scholz would discuss further defence assistance, the expansion of Ukraine's air defence system and joint arms production before the conference. The speeches of the conference itself are taking place as we speak, with Scholz vowing that there will be no military victory and no dictated peace as far as Russia is concerned, calling Putin to end his brutal campaign and withdraw his troops. That phrase, no dictated peace from Russia, is interesting and something I think all of us should make a note of. No dictated peace, I think, can also be read in the context in which he said it as referring to Western powers not dictating the peace that Ukraine would be obliged to agree to. Again, Let's make a mental note of that in the coming weeks and months. Now, Zelensky's made his own address too, where he, as he's since summarised, emphasised the importance of comprehensive efforts to defend Ukraine, ensure societal resilience and, quote, to preserve our common European way of life against Russian aggression. Now, I am, Dom, just going to quote some extracts from the speech. Bear with me, but I think it's actually quite important and worth taking the time to consider exactly what he has said here. So first of all, he said, this war has various levels of confrontation. The front line, where our people defend against military strikes, our economic defence to maintain normal social life and political resistance against attempts to divide and weaken the democratic world. Withstanding and winning this confrontation requires comprehensive efforts. First, the front line. Over two years of this war, Ukraine has proved it can push out the occupier and achieve necessary victories. Our key challenge now is to destroy Russia's air superiority, which includes its missile and bomb terror. Only by depriving Russia of this advantage will Putin consider a just peace. Air defence is the answer. Second, energy. One of Putin's main targets in Ukraine is energy infrastructure. He views energy resources as a weapon of influence and subjugation. Russian missile and drone strikes have already destroyed 9 gigawatts of power capacity. This is greater than the energy consumption of Berlin and Munich combined. We must preserve existing generation and restore lost capacity. This task is vital, not only for Ukraine, but also for Europe. Putin aims to refine practices for destroying energy objects. We need high yield investments for your companies and credit programs for your institutions. Together, we will create a new energy foundation, thousands of new jobs and significant economic growth. Third, politics. Every nation that shares European values and wants to live in peace needs the EU. Ukrainians, Moldovans, Georgians and Balkan states all respect Europe, freedom and the rule of law. Ukraine has already fulfilled all of the prerequisites for opening membership negotiations with the EU. This June must see the negotiation framework approved and talks begin. And lastly, motivation. In the 20th century, Europe underwent massive recovery after the war. Hundreds of agreements between our governments, communities and companies are now being prepared, including with partner countries outside of Europe. We will conclude this conference with agreements worth billions of euros for Ukraine's defence, energy and social life. This includes education, housing and medical equipment. 
I want to highlight support for entrepreneurship in Ukraine. This adds resilience and a sense that life will prevail. Ukraine will realise its national recovery project, which will become a European recovery project. So that was President Zelensky there laying out not just the case for the conference, but more broadly the goals for Kyiv diplomatically and economically at the present time. Hence why I've quoted it so extensively there. Obviously, though, it would be remiss not to mention that there are criticisms made of these recovery conferences. Some people say that they're more about talk and symbolism than action. I've spoken to some very senior people here who I trust in Britain who felt that the first one didn't really cement a concrete long-term strategic action plan for Kyiv's recovery. The fact that Ukraine's reconstruction agency chief resigned the day before as well, which I know you covered yesterday, suggests that the Ukrainian government is a tense place indeed at the moment. And I do wonder whether the fact that it's not talking about or at least not making lots and lots of connections to the first recovery conference is a sign that this is of more symbolic value and political value than it is the actual tangible agreements that are being made. This is not as yet anywhere near as well organised and orchestrated as something like the Marshall Plan, although it does speak to the language as I say, of the Marshall Plan. So just worth us pondering that, the fact that in Britain, for instance, there is no base, no headquarters to assist with Ukraine's recovery. It's just another person, invisible civil servant in Whitehall. Is that really good enough, given the state of play? I'm not sure. So that's the recovery to conference, Dom. Yeah, thanks, Francis. Interesting, you pick up on the phrase, uh, and obviously we've led with it with, with the title for today, No Dictated Peace. I had read that as Schultz saying that that, that, was, that Zelensky was not going to have any any of the West dictating peace. I, I, I just assumed that, that they, wouldn't, they wouldn't, wouldn't take dictated peace from Russia. Interesting that, um, uh, that, that it you know, might possibly be, be viewed that way. But I, I thought that was he was saying that we are not going to dictate peace to you. But as you say, it'd be interesting to see what comes out of, um, out of today and tomorrow. Now, not the only conference uh, going on right now. We'll talk about the BRICS in a moment, but just just very first, briefly, let's, let's dip our toe back into um, into uh, uh, well, when was it? When was it? The um, so Putin talking at the St. Petersburg Economic Forum. Um, he said that Europe's going to be defenceless, or Europe is defenceless and unprepared for nuclear conflict. He was speaking at the St. Petersburg Forum. And he said Europe does not have a developed early warning system. I like guess nuclear early warning system. He said in this sense they are more or less defenceless. He was on stage alongside Luis Arce, who's the uh, who's Bolivia's president, and Emerson Mnangagwa, who's uh, Zimbabwe's president. No, I'm not going to say that again. Um, which I thought was interesting. That stuck out to me, Francis, because we talked about. I mean, it's just. I mean, it's wrong. It's not right. It says there's no, no uh, defenses and, and no early warning system. I've been to Filingdale's. It's up in it's up in North Yorkshire. It was my mate Al, surname withheld, who who ran it. Uh, Vigilamus. We are watching. There, there's a there's an enormous great slabs like something out of, um, you know, two thousand and one, a space odyssey, uh, up in North Yorkshire. You can Google it. Google Filingdale's, and you'll see this enormous great radar station. It's part of the West Ballistic Early Warning System. So quite what Putin's going on about, I have no idea. But that was a St. Petersburg Economic Forum. Uh, he's been a busy boy. So, Francis, he then nips off to the BRICS. What can you tell us about the BRICS, Francis? Thanks, Tom. Just on that, I mean, I th- as you say, it is just the sabre rattling, isn't it? Any any use of nuclear threats has been effective in this war, and so it's no surprise that therefore he will make these kind of bellicose statements, which the West then will absorb and factor in, he hopes, to their calculations. But as you say, it's not factually accurate. And it is also just worth reflecting, too, that Russian and Belarusian troops have started the second stage of their tactical drills. It's the exact same thing. It is an attempt to threaten the West by saying, look, we're ready to do this. We are willing to go that far. Although really very few Western leaders, I would argue, think 
the logical thing through, which is where would they strike? Are they striking in somewhere in Ukraine? But hang on, don't they want to conquer Ukraine? Why would you want to strike somewhere you want to control? But then are you saying that you'd strike a NATO country? But if you do that, then it's definitely a World War Three situation and you're probably going to be uh, not wake up the next morning. So it just it, it, there is no logic to this apart from it being appealing to a domestic audience at home as well as Western leaders abroad who get very jumpy for obvious reasons about nuclear weapons talk. But as you say, Don, BRICS, uh, the other very important uh, block in this war, one some could argue, if we see NATO as one block, one of the instruments of the other block that is forming, albeit in the economic side, is BRICS, where we see um, the so-called emerging economies meet up. And what's particularly interesting about this one is that r- officials from Russia, Iran and China held bilateral meetings on the sidelines of the BRICS meeting yesterday. Lavrov spoke at that meeting and highlight- highlighted the organisation's recent expansion. And as you'd expect, he reiterated the standard Kremlin narratives about the Western rules-based order is detrimental to other states and about the supposed merits of the creation of a multipolar world. He claimed that there are the winds of change and that it's driving BRICS forward and that therefore officials from Brazil, South Africa, Ethiopia, Laos, Thailand, Sri Lanka, Kazakhstan, Saudi Arabia and Egypt would be in a stronger position with them than with other Western countries who would be no doubt trying to reach out to them for other such deals. So again, how do we read this? Well, BRICS really is a tool of Russia trying to get out its narrative and to forge economic ties with those countries who have not been obstacles for it in this war in terms of, say, the UN votes and have not sanctioned the country. That matters, given the fact that, yes, sanctions have not been anywhere near as effective as many believed or hoped. Um, I'd include myself in that, by the way. Um, But that's not to say they're not completely ineffective you know sanctions are still having an impact particularly in terms of key um, technological things but there are also loopholes having to be found so it's not to say that the, 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 the sanctions yes are not as effective as we hope but that's not to say they're ineffective so Russia does still need to cu- keep comp- companies and countries on side that are willing to trade with them. So that's one instrument of BRICS. It's also interesting that Russia's Davos um, is also taking place at the moment in uh, um, uh, Russian territory, Russian um, within Russian borders. And again, this is an example of Russia trying to provide an alternative model for countries of uh, of some of the Western models in terms of economic support, international bodies that maybe those countries don't necessarily want to be dealing with. And so they want to say, look, we are also an alternative and we have just as much power and prestige as they do. That's the message that Russia and Moscow wants to project. And so when it has its own Davos, then it's basically trying to uh, trying to emulate. But As they say, emulation is the uh, best form of flattery. And it does ultimately, I would argue, speak to the fact that for all of this talk about Russia trying to offer an alternative civilizational course as opposed to the wider West, the fact that they are still resorting to comparing themselves to their own version of Davos, their own version of NATO, it really speaks to the fact that they don't offer an alternative. All they can do is copy rather than create something new. So those are the other significant Russia based or at least Russia led or so they'd like to think with regards to BRICS big pushes at the moment taking place in this critical week as we've already described for the more western conferences of which of course the Switzerland Peace Summit will also be quite interesting. Yeah thanks Francis I'm sorry if this, if this sounds a bit clunky there's just so much going on we're trying to sort of blob it into its uh, into its most appropriate buckets if you if you know if, you, if I'm not mixing my metaphors there but if we've been speaking there about the well, less the military updates right at the start, but just now the, the sort of political strategic level. Let's bring it down a, a stage, if we may. Let's go to the military strategic level. And your old pal Mikhailo Podolyak has been tweeting this morning about, um, well, you tell us, what, what have you been looking at from, from Mr. Podolyak, uh, how he sees the strategic picture now, Francis? Well, thanks. Yeah, I think it's worth mentioning this because we were talking about the economic conference, which laid out the Ukrainian position in the economic and political spheres. So, as you say, I interviewed Podolyak on our trip to Kiev in February. Very, very senior advisor. Some would say the most senior advisor to President Zelensky and is in charge of his messaging 
to the world. So I'm sure Podolak had uh, an influence over the remarks that Zelensky made at the recovery conference. But he's tweeted what he defines as the key tasks of this phase of the war. So one, and this is, don't worry, this is much briefer than the remarks I quoted earlier from Zelensky. So one, destruction of logistics, bases, warehouses, transportation, training camps. Two, destruction of war support infrastructure on the territory of Russia, regardless of the depth. Three, complete rejection of the illusion that Russia is treaty capable and ready to return to the framework of international law. Four, ensuring parity in the weapons needed on the battlefield. Long range tools, aviation, missile defense systems. So there you have it. Pretty forthright and speaks, I think, to many of the things Kiev has been calling for for a long time, including when I was interviewing Podolyak and Danilov and you were interviewing Badanov all the way back in February. But that green light from Washington permitting use of Western backed weapons, Washington given weapons on Russian soil, albeit only on the Kharkiv front, was especially critical and has proven so for infrastructure and logistics in those areas. And indeed, they're now calling for ability to strike a little bit deeper into the country with those weapons. Although that's not to say they haven't already been using other weapons to strike, I think, a bit further afield, things that we've been reporting on. Now, just on this and the Washington position, it is worth just taking a moment to think about how this came to pass, how diplomacy actually works, the bread and the butter. Obviously, in this instance, I think it's fair to assume, and what we know so far, is it was through the strenuous efforts of Kiev and its Western allies putting pressure on Washington, who eventually, when the arguments were put to it, relented. There was a very interesting piece back in May in the Sunday Times here in London, which confirmed that it was Trump giving the nod to Mike Johnson, which ultimately broke the deadlock on the other key aspect of this, which is, of course, with the vital military aid package. But how did that happen? Well, that was also a similar picture. According to the piece, a one-on-one meeting was orchestrated by Britain's Foreign Secretary, Lord Cameron, which proved pivotal. Cameron is reported to have said, knowing that Trump wants a peace deal if he wins, he put it in realpolitics terms. He said, what are the best conditions in which you as president can make a deal in January? It's both sides holding their lines and paying a price for that. Trump replied, allegedly, No one has set this out for me in those terms. I'm glad we had this conversation. And then shortly afterwards, Trump posted that Europe needed to do more and that we all want a secure and strong Ukraine. Apparently, too, Boris Johnson, former prime minister, of course, integral in the early weeks and months of the war, has also been having conversations with Donald Trump and senior Republicans and was supposedly instrumental in pushing for the weapons permissions to be given by the White House. So he's also been having dialogues with them. That one example there further emphasizes two things. One, the critical role of Trump over the Republican Party, which should not be downplayed as people are looking up to him at the moment and looking for guidance on the foreign policy sphere as a result. And two, the key diplomatic role that Britain is playing behind closed doors. And I'm not doing that in a partisan sense. This really matters because Britain has been, I think, perceived by Kiev, and they've even articulated this as the key broker with Washington and with many of the other European capitals. That is why, arguably, or one of the reasons at least, that Zeluzhny is coming here as ambassador, former commander in chief. He knows what Ukraine needs. That's really going to matter when he's having conversations with British politicians who then go on and articulate the Ukrainian position to Western capitals. So, again, The role of Britain in this war, it's not always avert. And I know there have been criticisms that have been made. Indeed, I've probably made some of them myself about us not going further in terms of weapons deliveries, in terms of policy commitments, etc. But certainly from Kiev's perspective, Britain is doing a lot. And so I mention this here as a little bit more of an in-depth extension on this diplomatic discussion. But of how this actually works and the work that London and other capitals, of course, are doing on other issues to try and move things forward. It's not all conducted in the public sphere. Indeed, very little of it is. We don't see it. We only hear about it afterwards. But by goodness, does it matter? Yes, and it is interesting. I, I, we're not being little Englanders here, I don't think, when we talk about oh, Britain, Britain's role on the world stage. I mean, it is. It, we do have our moments, middle-ranking power and all that, but uh, very, very occasionally 
we do step out of the history books and actually contribute something, which is why I was very interested in Rishi Sunak's no-show at Normandy, the D-Day ceremony, closing the D-Day week last week at Omaha Beach. We will speak about that shortly because I want to sort of go, go a bit back and forth, Francis. But just before we do, just quickly, I know you want to have a, a, a quick mes- um, mention a bit further afield uh, on the military st- strategic side. You want to take us to uh, Czechia and then Sri Lanka, and then we'll come back to northern France. Yeah, uh, so listeners will recall, this is a bit bit of a, a, an out there one in some respects, but listeners will recall there's been a lot of talk recently from intelligence services and certain politicians in Central and Eastern Europe about this term hybrid war and the fact that Russia is already waging a hybrid war on the West. And we've brought up numerous instances of where there have been cases of places blowing up and supposed sabotage from Russia intelligence gathering, all of these sorts of things. Um, But it is evident that in Czechia, at least, and I think in Britain too, actually, given the remarks of the MI6 chief a few weeks ago, that things are escalating and escalating quite considerably. So the Czech prime minister has said today that a failed arson attack that took place in Prague last week was very likely organised and financed by Russia. So he's speaking after a meeting of the National Security Council. He said this failed attack was evidently part of a hybrid campaign of sabotage being run by Moscow against European countries. The police arrested a foreign citizen who was who was charged in connection with the incident and is being held in custody on terrorism charges. He's described as a Spanish speaking man originally from South America and apparently only been in the country for five years days. Now, I was in Paris a few days ago and there was a story there in the newspapers about instances of Moscow leaving, um, it was coffins under the Eiffel Tower. Again, this was believed to have been carried out by foreign nationals who were paid, allegedly, by the Kremlin to do this. So we've got sabotage, we've got propaganda and more importantly, world leaders talking about this and talking about it publicly. Now, the big fear of course, is what would happen, and this is something that we talked about in the essay series that we were talking about last week and publishing about what if Putin wins. The fear is, is that if Ukraine were to fall, that the hybrid war would escalate very much considerably because the borders of Russia essentially would be much closer and their ability to be able to be doing much more with that geography and with the newfound capacity would mean this would be greatly extrapolated. But we are seeing, and I think, and learning a lot more about how Kremlin is operating. It's not all overt. A lot of it is behind closed doors and a lot of it is subverting by not using agents that are their own FSB officers like the Salisbury attack, which obviously when they're caught or are frame, you know, are, are, are framed by the media as being the people responsible. I don't mean framed as in wrong, but I mean framed as in like we're talking about it and we've got their pictures on the front pages. Um, as opposed to that, Moscow's adapted and is hiring foreign nationals. And which, as you say, Dom, it's interesting to hear Sri Lanka, a country that we don't often talk about on the podcast, has asked Russia to stop recruiting fighters from the island. So the foreign ministry has said that it is angry um, and is, wants to receive assurances from Moscow that it should stop recruiting its citizens to fight in Ukraine following allegations that thousands have been duped into combat roles. Now, again, that's different from the intelligence point, but it speaks to this broader strategy that Moscow seems to have been adopting for some months now, maybe even for over a year or two, of uh, trying to recruit foreign nationals, not only for the front lines, but also for sabotage instances, for counterintelligence, for intelligence gathering, for hybrid warfare. And so we're learning a lot. And these two small stories would be very, very easy to miss, Dom, very, very easy for us to just not focus on because they're nowhere near on the surface as important as some of the headline stories we've discussed today. But if you look at those two stories, you look at other stories we've talked about in recent weeks and you start joining the dots like you're a detective in a noir film and you've got the board on the wall, you know, you start joining those pieces of those images together with bits of string and pins, you can start to see that we're learning a lot here about how Moscow is changing its strategy. And I think that will have ramifications as this so-called hybrid war ramps up. Back to Normandy. So we were there. I was um, zipping around at the American uh, cemetery. Uh, you, were, you were somewhere else. I think you were in the VIP section when you 
Well, I didn't get I didn't get that far. I was just in the press section. Um, and then I was down at Omaha Beach. But um, I have my thoughts on on Rishi Sunak's no show. But firstly, what were your your reflections from Normandy, Francis? Well, it was one of the most memorable trips I've I've certainly ever done for the Telegraph, and indeed over the course of my life, actually, I would say. I mean, as I said on the podcast on the sixth of June, I managed to tune in from the ceremony. There were two main things that stood out to me that day, which was, of course, first of all, the fact that this will probably be the last anniversary, certainly significant anniversary, where there will be veterans present. And so in that sense, or at least a sizable number of them, we might have have a, a handful left. And so in that sense, it was, of course, historic and incredibly moving. One of the moments that I will long remember was the moment that we saw the first of many veterans who had been um, brought onto the main stage refuse to use a wheelchair and actually got up and marched to the stage and then saluted the flag. And you can imagine the reception he received from the, it must have been 5,000 5, plus in the crowd. Um, it was incredibly touching. Um, the other thing as well that really jumped out at me uh, in terms of its political and symbolic significance was Biden's speech. And as I said at the time, I really, really felt that it was something that went far beyond what a US president would ever normally say at an event of that magnitude. I thought the normal cautious response by aides would be to say, we're going to try and perhaps make veiled references to the international situation at the moment situation, but we will not say explicitly that there is a direct connection between what Putin is doing in Ukraine and the Second World War. We'll try and keep them a bit separate. That's what certainly what Macron did. But Biden went all in. I mean, he spoke animatedly um, about the importance of the war for Ukraine. And I quoted him extensively on the 6th and was basically saying that Ukraine is fighting for the same values as those who died on the beaches of Normandy. American soldiers, many of them, uh, were, were fighting for then. It's a huge thing to say when you are, of course, in a position that America may not be willing to support Ukraine under a Trump presidency. And indeed, that is why I think he said it, because he then used that to attack what he perceived as Trump's isolationism. And indeed, he used that term. So I think it's a very significant politically. I'd be interested, Dom, in your reflections on the international event afterwards, the one that Rishi Sunak was absent from, because there were also some very moving scenes there, not least, of course, when Zelensky was talking to the veteran. But if I may just add one other thing, which is more broad than, than this, just reflecting on Normandy itself. The whole of the period there, and I'm sure you felt the same, was just remarkable for the cherishing of the memory by everybody who was present, the ordinary people, the police, the organisers. There was a real reverence and I didn't see or hear anybody raise their voice. I didn't see anybody who I thought was being disrespectful. It was incredibly well run, organised, and you could tell that it was something that the world was watching. You really felt that for those couple of hours or so, that there was nowhere else more important in the world than those beaches, not especially when President Zelensky arrived. And there was a palpable energy as a result. And the tragedy, of course, is Dom, it will be our loss, is that we may never have that again, because part of that magic came from the veterans. Indeed, the vast majority of it came from them. And with them gone, it will be our responsibility to pick up the mantle of what they represented. And that challenge is ours now. Remembering the past is about more than just reflection. It is about action. And as I say, that's something that is being sorely tested at the moment. But a remarkable couple of days, and I'm extremely grateful to the charity Ukraine Focus who got me in to the American cemetery um, of Omaha Beach. Without them, I wouldn't have been able to be there. And I'll talk a little bit later on this week about what I got up to with them on the driving and delivering of those ambulances uh, as they're going on the way to Ukraine. Yeah, it was really interesting from my my point of view. So this is obviously we we have remembrance um, every year in the UK. Other countries have different dates for recognising the uh, those that have gone before. And I've said many times, including on this podcast, Alpha, I think for soldiers, sailors, airmen, women, etc., veterans, rem remembrance is is not a is not a thing. It's not a day. It's it's a 
it's a, a way of life. It's like uh, it's like the tinnitus that we all have. It's just it's just there constantly. You are remembering your your friends and and uh, and what have you. But for us in the UK, remembrance, which is which is very uh, well, the cenotaph was created in 1919, I think, here in in central London. So the First World War, there are no longer any veterans from the First World War in the UK, and the Second World War is slipping out of lived experience and lived knowledge. So the veterans that we saw at Normandy last week, yes, this is probably the last biggest official recognition of their actions. So it's about to move into remembrance as opposed to, I don't know, commemoration or you know, whatever the correct word would be. It was a wonderful occasion. I don't mean I don't mean it was like, you know, as I've said before, it's not sort of laughy jokey. It was just it was I was there it was one wonderful, full of wonder and respect and love. Later on that evening, so that was in the afternoon, kind of early early afternoon, we then went down onto Omaha Beach and there was a temporary structure, a sort of three sided, tiered seating, um, an event space in the middle, piano, big video screens, and this was a a celebration, if you like, a celebration of the veterans and those that didn't make it that far up the beach. And that's the event that all the international leaders, to which all the international leaders were were invited. So we in the stands, we could we could not see the international leaders arriving, but we, we they're on the video screens, and then and so we go, ooh, look, it's so and so. We saw him on the telly, and then they'd walk into the space, and then there'd be more applause, and we actually saw them saw them in real life, as it were, and it was great. No, we had people turning up. Justin Trudeau did turn up, and there were gasps. I know some some of our uh, some of our Canadian listeners did did message me and say, "Really, there were gasps?" Oh, but yes, yes, there were. I mean, people around me were going, oh, "Justin Trudeau." Um, so he he turns up and sort of you know, flicks his bouffant and stroll, strolls in. Uh, prince William was there. Um, the the Prince of Wales, very very sunburnt. Petra Pavel, the uh, President of Czechia. Uh, I said he looked like a cool Santa. He just strode in a lovely pale blue suit. And it was a it was a nice thing. They all came in. They went and met straight away. They went to the veterans. Olaf Schultz popped up. Each of them met sort of almost at the front door type thing or wherever the VIP um, Range Rovers were chucking them all out. Um, met by President uh, Macron, and then we saw on the screen we saw President Zelensky step out. Or there was a kind of ripple, and I think maybe somebody had seen the uh, the number plate because they've all got the, the where the the country's from and a big sticker in the main in the window. Maybe someone had seen and said Ukraine, but there was there was a palpable ripple through the audience, and then President Zelensky stepped out of the car, and the the place was like, oh, it just went mad, it just went mad, and then he came into the actual arena, and uh, and it was it was very very impressive. And then the event started, and there were it was it started with a troop of of children, probably about three dozen children singing uh, a song which I vaguely recognised. But I, I couldn't quite put my finger on it. I turned to the, to the woman on my left who was, um, who was a French citizen working in the US Embassy. And I said, what, what's this song? She said, it's the song of resistance, the French resistance song. And it just, it was, it was beautiful. And it just really set the tone. And they, they then moved into a, into a sort of a, a dance uh, passage, which was played. They had a piano on stage. A chap came out and played Nocien Number no. 1 by Eric Sarty um, as these children were moving. It was just, it was graceful. It was beautiful. We were looking out as the sun was setting over Omaha Beach. The shadow is getting longer. There's a number of warships out in the in the water. The veterans were there. The international leaders were there. It was all, I'd say, it was somber and reflective, but but also a celebration. I mean, I saw a number of international leaders, world leaders, greeting each other with genuine warmth. I know they're very good at turning it on for the crowds, but there was genuine warmth, not not between everyone, but between some of them, genuine warmth. And so it's a it's a moment for these people to get together they don't often, don't often see each other and the and the celebration of the veterans i mean there was a veteran there a chap 98 year old um, eric berthold i think his name was he read out the letter that he had sent home 80 years previously um so he had the letter and of course he's sending a letter home so it's not it, it wasn't doom and gloom it was all hey everything's fine i'm having a great time getting a suntown and so on and so forth and he said uh mum it's uh, it, oh, mom sorry mom it's swell They've got American candy. I mean, it was a, it's a nice letter. Um, so it wasn't the letter itself, itself wasn't sort of full of, sort of deep meaning and pathos. Um, but the fact that he was reading the letter he sent home 80 years ago and he finished and he smiled and saluted and the whole place nearly, nearly took the, the temporary roofs off. It was it was incredible. Then President Macron stepped up. He gave a speech. 
and I could tell my I was hanging on to his ankles with my with my French, but I could tell that it was he was it, the way he delivered it, the, the the tone of his voice that it would raise and lower. Sometimes they were they were you know he was using pauses very well. He was speaking softly, then he was speaking quite hard, and it was just uh, the lilt of it was perfect. But there, uh, you could tell when it was coming towards the end, and the crowd could tell it was coming towards the end. And they started standing up. People were standing up and, and clapping. And a few cheers were breaking out. Before he'd finished speaking, but they could sort of, I don't know, maybe they've, maybe they've heard it before and knew where it was going. But he finished off as, as, he, as he always does, you know, vive la republic, a vive la France. And at that point, my God, the, the whole place went bonkers. Broke out into La Marseillaise, the French national anthem. Everyone just booming it out. At this point, I'm, I'm, I'm all in. You know, I was singing La Marseillaise as, as hard as I could. At mangling it completely an absolute absolute mess but nobody nobody cared because it wasn't about that it was just about being there being in the moment being with friends being with allies celebrating the vets thinking about what they did for us thinking about that this sort of event and the the children there probably wouldn't wouldn't be there and wouldn't be able to live the lives they have and the futures they have if it hadn't been for the veterans well i was mentioning you Francis, well at the time and saying my god this is this is this is it this is uh, well soft power if you like if you want to put a clunky term on it but this is this is incredible to be part of this is the international community today europe the united states and rishi sunat the british prime minister was not there and it was so obvious it was just it, him not being there was obvious his absence was obvious and it just it just it was so disappointing um and so and so palpable in this what had morphed into a I know a happy time if it's, if it's right to say to say that. And the leaders they all they all hung around at the end, and there was lots of photos and selfies and all those sort of things that they they put out. And the British Prime Minister was not there, and I just thought that's that is extraordinary. It was it was a a moment of of international camaraderie and brotherhood um, in these dark days. Numerous references to to Ukraine throughout the uh, throughout the whole week. Um, and Britain just didn't turn up. It was extraordinary. Well, Dom, yeah, I, it, it said it all really. And, and for those listeners who aren't aware, there was massive fallout for the British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak for not attending. He did send Lord Cameron, but the feeling was that the fact that he was there at the major British ceremony, which we haven't talked about today because neither of us were able to make that one, uh, the fact that he went to that in the morning and then didn't go to this sort of anti- international allies one that Dom attended is what has upset people so much because they felt that it was a slight, despite the fact that he had spent quite a lot of time with with uh, with veterans um, early on. So I don't think it was a disrespect in that sense. It's just pure political miscalculation and something that is really unforgivable, frankly, as but not least his advisers who should have seen, should have known that it was a terrible, terrible look, as well as missing out on a golden opportunity to cement alliances and to have conversations with the most powerful people in the world who are shaping all of our fates. So I hope listeners will forgive our extended reflections on D-Day, but it was a genuine historic moment. It was a privilege for Dom and I to be there covering it for The Telegraph and for you. And interested in hearing your reflections. I mean, I imagine that many of you listening now were the children of veterans or that your grandparents were the people who were on those beaches or on other battlefields. And so do send us your reflections about what D-Day meant to you 80 years on. I know we'd be honoured to read them. One final word from me on it, which is that, as I say, I was there with an organisation transporting ambulances to Ukraine, each of which will save over 250 lives in their lifetimes. And there was a huge historic resonance there in ways not only from the Second World War, but from the first too. And so if listeners will be kind enough to bear with me over the next week or two, I'm putting together a special episode on that where you'll hear some of the aeroplanes flying over at the D-Day. You'll hear about our journey across halfway across Europe. They're still driving as I speak. And you'll hear about the individuals who are volunteering their time and their money in order to not just talk about Ukraine, but to actually do something to improve the lives. And that for me 
is what it was all about, the symbol of the fact that the Ukrainian flag was lifted over Utah Beach and a ceremony given there before the ambulances left by the mayor of that area saying that what Ukraine is fighting for is in parallel with what those brave soldiers gave their lives for was very powerful and something that will live long in my memory. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To support our work and to stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, please subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just £1 at www.telegraph.co.uk forward slash Ukraine The Latest. Or sign up to Dispatches, our foreign affairs newsletter, bringing stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine Live blog on our website, where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day, including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. We also do the same for other breaking international stories. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm London time each weekday on Twitter or X Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on X so that you don't miss it. To our listeners on YouTube, please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload. So if you want to hear Ukraine the latest as soon as it's released, do refer to podcast apps. If you appreciated this podcast, please consider following Ukraine the latest on your preferred podcast app and leave us a review as it helps others find the show. Please also share it with those who may not be aware we exist. As the disinformation war ramps up, we are relying on your support more than ever. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do continue to read every message. You can also contact us directly on X. You can find our handles in the description for this episode. As ever, we are especially interested to hear where you are listening from around the world. Ukraine The Latest was today produced by Phil Atkins. Executive producers are David Knowles and Louisa Wells.